Good morning and welcome everyone who is logging on to the CPRND webinar this morning. We are going to give it just another minute or two to allow everyone time to log in and then we'll get started. So welcome everyone. Good morning and welcome to those who are logging on to our very first uh, CPRD webinar. We're excited to have everyone here today. We are going to get started in just another minute or two. We're going to give a few minutes to allow time for everyone to log on and then we'll get started. Good morning and welcome to everyone who is joining us this morning for our first inaugural webinar for CPRND. We're excited to have everyone with us. We are going to go ahead and get started. Um, so just want to welcome everyone again um, to our webinar today, an introduction to the patient community. We're looking forward to this morning and having the opportunity to share an overview of the CPRND program and also to gain insight from uh, the patient community this morning on the initiative and uh, what we're doing here. So welcome again to everyone. I'm going to go ahead and start with just a couple housekeeping items. Um, so uh, if you have questions throughout the presentation that you would like to ask regarding any information that's shared or questions specifically to our panelists, um, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A box. Um, the chat uh, feature is disabled right now for, um, for everyone just so that we can make sure that we're not missing any questions that pop up. So if you have questions, go ahead and put those into the Q&A box and then that way we'll make sure that we can see all of those when the time comes. Um, also just to note that all of the participant lines are muted so that we can reduce background noise. So uh, uh, just wanted to let you know that. We are also recording this so that we can make this available to those who uh, weren't able to join us today. We will share the link to that to all of the participants once that's up. So if you have colleagues who weren't able to join today and you'd like to share, um, please feel welcome to do so. You will get a link to that. And then I've also included a contact uh, email address here if you have any questions after the fact. We will also provide contact information for uh, the entire CPRD team here at CPATH um, later on. So again, welcome. We're excited to have you here. So quickly just want to talk through what the agenda is going to look like and then I'll hand it over to our first speakers. So we'll start out today with a few opening remarks um, and we're excited to have Jacqueline Corrigan Cray and Klaus Romero do those uh, opening remarks. From there we'll have Colin Hovengay join us for um, the CPRD overview to share a little bit about um, how we came to be and what we're trying to do with this exciting initiative. Um, and then from there, we'll move into the panel discussion and Q&A section. Um, and then we'll end today with a few closing remarks. 
So at this point, I would like to turn it over to our um, our speakers who will be welcoming us. So we have Dr. Jacqueline Corrigan Cray, who's the Principal Deputy Center Director for CEDAR at uh, Food and Drug Administration. And we also have Dr. Klaus Romero, who is the Chief Science Officer here at Critical Path Institute. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and ask for both of them to turn their cameras on. And Jacqueline, if you'd like to start with just a few words of welcome. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Laura. And I want to thank everyone for joining us this morning on this webinar. And uh, in particular, I want to thank Colin and you know, all his colleagues at CPATH for not only organizing this webinar, but for taking on this important role as the convener of the public-private partnership between FDA and NIH on ALS and other rare neurodegenerative diseases. You know, it's been an exciting time recently. Um, we have been bringing new therapeutics to patients. We have, after many years, a new therapy for ALS, Relivrio. And we also recently approved the first treatment for Friedrich's ataxia. Uh, I'm going to give you the brand name. It's a little easier for me, Sky Claris, as well as the first treatment for Rett syndrome. And these are all in the Center for Drugs. And in the last fall, our Center for Biologics also approved a gene therapy to slow the progression of neurologic dysfunction in boys 14 to 17 years with early active cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy, known as Skysona. You know, these are really exciting developments for patients and their loved ones, but it should only be a start. We really need to build on these successes and bring more treatments for these and other rare neurologic diseases. We need to begin to transform these diseases before they have what is often devastating and irreversible effects. And CPATH is uniquely positioned to lead this initiative to success. They have many years working with FDA and understand how to advance regulatory science that will have a real impact on drug development programs. As Colin will discuss, they have partnered with us to set up a successful platform for data sharing that is the first step into bringing new insights into drug development. They are already working on a number of rare neurological diseases, including Huntington's and ataxias, and are ready to bring their experience to work with FDA and NIH to further development of therapies for ALS. To be successful in this endeavor, we really need everyone to contribute. We need you as patients, caregivers, and advocates to help us shape a successful path forward. Importantly, we are bringing the complementary resources of NIH and FDA to the table to work together. You live with these diseases and your experience and insights will be critical as we move forward to tackle the challenges for drug development. We intend to work with you, with academics, with industry to identify the challenges and more importantly, the solutions. So we want this to be the start of a successful partnership that will change the trajectory of drug development for ALS and other rare neurodegenerative diseases. I'm so pleased we have a great panel today. I wanna to thank them for joining us today. They're gonna to provide you some insight on their goals for the public-private partnership. And we are very excited to hear your questions and receive your input and help us really shape this initiative. So I wanna thank you again for joining and I'd like to turn it over to Klaus. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, and thanks everybody for joining. I'm going to start with a with a quote that uh, has been made famous by our friends from the National Organization for Rare Disorders. Alone, we might be rare, but together we are strong. And I think this not only applies to rare diseases and rare neurodegenerative diseases in particular, but this applies to the strengths of public-private partnerships like CPRND. These public-private partnerships are intended to uh, synergize and avoid reinventing the wheel or having uh, parallel efforts that end up competing with each other. What this brings to the table is the opportunity for uh, rare diseases to continue to be a major area of innovation. And both FDA and NIH really care about this and their uh, investment and participation in CPRND is a testament to that. Key areas uh, where CPRND is going to focus are areas of key innovation for medical product development, patient-focused drug development, digital health technologies, 
innovative trial designs, model-informed drug development, real-world data and real-world evidence, advanced biomarkers, gene and cell-based therapies. Those are all areas where the, the rare disease community, and in particular, the rare neurodegenerative uh, disease community, has an opportunity to not only provide a lot of benefit to uh, the patients and their families, but to provide a lot of learnings for other rare diseases and also for non-rare diseases. I think the time of having the non-rare diseases taking the lion's share of resources, that's important, but then to hope that somehow the rare diseases would be paid attention to is over. And now we're seeing how the rare disease uh, examples are providing those learnings for the non-rare disease side of the medical product development equation. And that is exciting. All hinges on uh, the opportunity to maximize the value of every precious data points that you as a patient community provide through your participation in research. That's what we're here for. That's our commitment and we'll make this happen. With that, thank you very much. And I will turn over to our Vice President for uh, Rare and Orphan Diseases, uh, Dr. Colin Hobinge. Uh, I'm terribly excited that uh, he decided to join us uh, last October. Colin brings in uh, a major amount of uh, experience and expertise in drug development, uh, in pediatric drug development, in rare disease drug development, in neuroscience. Uh, he has uh, a, a regulatory past as well, which is very exciting for us. And uh, with that, Colin, take it away. Thank you. I want to echo to the welcome that has been extended to everyone. I really am excited that you all are here. Um, one of the things that in joining CPATH, it was, it was really um, a great opportunity for me to impact the areas that were near and dear to my heart. So you know, one of the things you, I hope you hear in, in my words is that the passion and commitment to the community and that that is undertones why I, I do what I do. So um, next slide. What we're going to talk about today before the panel um, is we're going to begin to talk a little bit about what critical path is, because some of you may be new to it. We're going to talk about the critical path for rare neurodegenerative diseases, which you'll hear me uh, say CPRND, and then we'll discuss the next steps and mechanisms for which you can be involved. And I really want to stress that, you know, our commitment to making this an, an, uh, a front porch for dialogue and, and accountability is going to be really critical to the success of this effort. We want to hear from patients. We want to hear your pain points. We want to hear you know, how we can do a better job of designing tools that will advance drug development and all the rare neurodegenerative disease uh, diseases that we can we can we can impact. Next slide, please. Now, CPATH isn't new. Um, it's been around for over 15 years now. Um, it's we we colloquially say it's the best kept secret. Um, but the mission of of CPATH is is truly one that I think all of us as 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 humans and as as patients and as caregivers all feel really dedicated to and and. And what we want to do is, is working at accelerating paths to a healthier world. Our goal you know, at CPATH is to, to begin to look at addressing those bottlenecks that slow um, drug development down so that we can get effective and safe treatments available as soon as possible to the patients that, that are near and dear to us. Our vision you know, is, is really, I, I won't read this in great detail, but we, we, we're a partner here. We're, we're a neutral convener. We have um, you know, a, a role as a, as a mediator, as a gatherer of intellect, and really um, address the patient community, you know, uh, pharma, pharma companies, um, regulators, and, and um, academic researchers, with the goal of coming up with solutions to those bottlenecks. Uh, next slide. How we do this is, is we come as that neutral convener. We develop programs, um, one of which is public-private partnerships. We convene patients, industry, academia, and government for sharing data and their expertise. The goal is to produce the best science 
and to make recommendations for, for new innovations so that we can further advance science. And that's one of the undertones that you're going to hear within the CPR and the initiative and the, the connection that we're having with, with NIH is, is really one that I in particular value and think it's important. And I, I see the sky's the limit in, in this collaboration. Um, we hope to bring the broadest experience. And then the goal is to really work through generating consensus because we want to identify areas by which that are meaningful to the stakeholders involved. And obviously we want to, we, you know, a sustainable model which we shared risks and responsibilities, but our goal is really to create an ecosystem that, that works on problem solving. <laughs> One of the things that, you know, that makes us a little bit different from other parties is that when we develop drugs uh, development solutions is that they, they um, are, are done in a way by which they're submitted for regulatory approval. That means that they're recognized by regulatory agencies for consideration as, as tools that can be used in regulatory grade clinical trials. Regulatory clinical trials are the ones that ultimately lead to a patient being approved for marketing and use um, for, for in the US or, or Europe. Um, we focus a lot on, on these. We, we typically do submissions both to FDA and EMA for HACTUS, but we also have done submissions to other jurisdictions as well. Everyone in this call can appreciate with, with rare diseases how important this is to the broader community because in many instances, the, the, the patients that are involved in a rare disease, in order to complete a trial or to complete a drug development plan, you have to have patients from multiple parts of the globe to be successful and to get a, a product to market very quickly. Next slide, please. Um, one of the things that, you know, the sort of looking at the whole schema that which, which really represents is how CPAP really, you know, begins from describing an unmet medical need, implying what, it, what we call it our core competencies. Um, think of this as you know all the tools that we 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 take from those questions. You know we begin to to characterize by outroad, outreach and engagement. You know discussing with various stakeholders where are your pain points, where are your bottlenecks, and then we develop and synthesize questions that are are questions that can be targeted to a regulatory solution. So what we have expertise in you know, validation of biomarkers, uh, clinical outcome assessment tools. Um, so, you know, things that address endpoints, digital uh, biomarkers, um, things that might be rating scales, all those things with the goal of, of trying to incorporate them, look at them critically and, and make them so that they can be recognized for regulatory review. Um, we have modeling and analytics. We have just an amazing team of people in our quantitative medicine program who have extensive experience in advanced trial design methodologies, creating these disease progression models, uh, trial simulation tools, all of which, you know, for the patient community, that might mean a shorter trial. It might mean a, a decision not to intrude a trial that might not be effective. Um, it could mean you know, altering the number of patients that might be in a control arm in a study. So less patients, you know, exposed to a, a placebo arm. Um, and then we have regulatory expertise in the space. And one can appreciate with all the, the changes in, in rare disease compared to like what I would consider um, larger population drug development, being savvy about understanding those issues around drug approval in the rare disease space is really critical for, for identifying you know, ways in which to answer questions and develop solutions in, in um, the rare disease drug development space. The, the last one is a shining star, and I, I can't echo more, and many of you may have already talked to Alex, who's our executive director for the RDC ADAPT program, but we have just an amazing um, real, uh, real world data and analytics platform that really works on aggregating data from diverse sources, sources like trial, uh, clinical trials from patient registries, even EHR data, all coming up with standards and being able to look at data in very unique ways so that we can create um, solutions and drug development tools. Below this, what you'll see is some of the concentration areas. It's Critical Path Institute. We're housed within the rare and orphan disease space. And, and as you can see, 
you know, we do have conversations with areas such as neuroscience, you know, and safety science in pediatrics, et cetera. Um, next slide, please. This just gives you a flavor of some of the consortia that we have at Critical Path Institute. I'm not gonna go over these great detail. Critical Path you know, has extensive experience in working with diverse populations and has done multiple projects across each of these consortia. As you see in those little boxes, there are some of our new initiatives or ones that are interconnected and rare diseases. This is a list that will continue to grow and we, we hope to keep this community informed of those as well. Next slide. Um, I wanted to give you an example of, of some of the projects. This is a, not an exhaustive list. It is a snapshot of, of some, but give you an example of some of the tools that we created or not, that we, we, we validated, tools that we created and validated. Um, as you can see, there's a diverse number of diseases here. Um, and you know, everything from biomarkers to endpoints are all listed here. You know, and, and the point of this is, is that we plan to take this same level of experience and apply this to rare neurodegenerative diseases in CPRND. So as you think of this, you know, think of this as this is your to, future to-do list and, and you know, cap capacity list. And so this is this is what we'll be approaching in, in our next steps. Uh, next slide. Now, um, what the rest of the talk is really going to focus is on the CPRND initiative itself. Um, this initiative was was created from an FDA award um, that followed from the accelerated accelerating access to critical therapies for ALS Act, the Act for ALS. The FDA approached us to establish a public-private partnership with FDA and NIH that would include patients, their advocates, researchers, industry, all at advancing research in ALS and other neurodegenerative diseases. When I joined CPATH, one of the clear things that we did was we wanted to take the opportunity to, to slingshot ahead some of our other initiatives in rare neurodegenerative diseases. So we immediately reorganized our organization to include uh, CPRND, to include Huntington's disease and, um, and uh, the Ataxia program, uh, CPTA. One of the things that was, was critical about this was that they came with shared learnings. There's experience, and I think Ron will, will talk a bit and Lauren will talk a bit earlier on the panel. From their experiences, um, we wanted to have the like conditions together so that we could take shared learnings, utilize shared resources, and begin to be more efficient and timely about how we, we apply our, our core competencies to uh, develop drug development tools to meet unmet needs. The, the new kit on the block is going to be ALS. Um, this is exciting for us. It's, it's the first foray for a de, new, de novo project that we're going to be we, we're launching as we speak. Um, and this isn't going to be all that we do. In our conversations with, with FDA and establishing this partnership, it was very clear that we were all in agreement that we didn't want to just stop with these three conditions. We wanted to uh, tackle and, and work with as many communities as, as time, talent, and treasure would allow. One of the things I want to echo in, in this is that, you know, a critical role in this is going to be the input from patients, caregivers, and advocacy community. I, I, I jokingly say, be selfish, be loud. Um, and I, I say that because we need to hear from you as so we can think about how best to address the needs of your community. Um, one thing that was ongoing in our other outreach has been collaboration with researchers and industry. Uh, we've had multiple conversations with these will continue and we'll begin to identify gaps in development as, as time goes forward and, and report those out. Next slide, please. Now I wanted to highlight the connection of the different agent entities. This is a this is a wonderful opportunity. You know, if we're all equal partners in this, CPRND is very connected to um, FDA, NIH, FINH as well. Um, we're, we're gonna be working very closely together. We're also gonna, we both, and you know, all I guess both is the wrong word. I guess all of this have really had the, the vision of, of beginning to outreach and connect with stakeholders to address the questions that, that focus on this needs. 
there'll be regular dialogue. We've, we're, we're working to align our, our efforts and, then in, and there'll be more to come in this. And, and you can ask those questions in the panel discussion, but this, we plan to all work in sync and in together. Next slide. Now, one of the things that this relationship affords that you know we we have not um, undertaken as critically as we can we could have in CPATH in previous years is just the the unique relationship with our partners. Um, CPATH is, has a long-standing history with with FDA and and working on drug development tools in its space. But one of the challenges is you know you're limited to what the available data that you have to do to work with to produce the tools that you, that you were able to, to produce. And so one of the things that this NIH, FINH relationship does is allows us to identify gaps in, in where, where, the, where we have gaps in data or gaps in science. We can provide that as, as feedback to NIH and they can target additional research efforts in both preclinical and clinical destruction or translational research. And we can do this as part of re reiterative process and, and a learning confirmed process. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to give a quick update to where we're at. Um, you know, early, when, as began, as I mentioned a bit earlier, you know, we have had um, an accelerated launch with the inclusion of HD risk and CPTA. Um, we had done two submissions at the, the end of last year, beginning of this year to FDA and EMA um, in those communities. Um, we also are working on developing what we call task groups, which are really rapidly accelerated projects and um, Friedrichs Ataxia and PXP um, that will be launching this year at any moment actually where the PSP one is, is ramping up. This will serve this connection with um, RDCA DAP will really um, serve as a catalyst as sort of a, a pilot project research and development space for initiatives that ultimately roll into the larger CPRD initiative. Um, so we have a lot of potential from that. And I think we have, there'll be a lot of activity for this going forward. And it really wants to echo the connection between the rare disease uh, analytics platform and uh, CPRD is because I think that they have significant potential for success. Um, we're map the other things to note is we're mapping stakeholder needs and endpoints. You know, we're doing a lot of analysis of landscape to address needs. We're holding meetings to begin discuss with the community, and we will be um, furthering these dialogues going forward. And we'll having multiple meetings to to get your voice in our uh, for the discussions identifying needs. Next slide, please. Now, one of the things that's been important and and to this initiative is the dialogue between the different agencies. We've been having regular meetings working with NIH and FNIH to work on expanding you know, the collaboration between and designing of the public-private partnership between the agent, all of these efforts. The, the goal of this was not to, to cause duplication. It was to align processes, to increase efficiency, to divide and conquer, and to begin to working together in very new and effective ways that to, to address ALS. This strategy, you know, and everyone on the team is very focused on developing an overarching strategy that is agile, responsive, and ultimately produces its successes um, and, and engages that patient community in the, as, as we move forward. These roles and responsibilities, you know, you know, that we take are very seriously. We're, we're having meetings to outline who's um, divvying up what efforts and what projects. We're working on shared learnings. You know, we've, we've had multiple dialogues, lots of discovery. We're working together to understand that. We're becoming um, aligned to create data plan, discussing what our advocacy efforts are. And ultimately, what we're looking at creating a common roadmap and pipeline for, for these efforts going forward. Um, you can expect to hear more about this as time goes on. You know, we, we all on the team will be very much open to communication and, and, and dialogue and, and to, to hear, you know, how we're doing as we enroll uh, these, these roadmap and pipeline. Now, our next steps, 
um, we'll be having more and more meetings to, to convene the prioritization of, of our efforts. And you'll, Walter may be alluding to what some of the NIH um, RFPs will look like this, this year, um, but I'll leave that to him. Next slide. Now, how can you get a hold of us and how do you engage us? We are having uh, two open house landscaping discussions and are listed here uh, this month. These are the, the most, the next recent two. We will having, you know, either patients or industry. Um, you can email us for more information. Um, share your data, your registry or your clinical trial data. It's, we'll we'll um, accept that and we'll be beginning to synthesize our data warehouse. And then, you know, going forward, we plan to have town hall meetings over the next several months. And then we'll be having a fall rare disease annual meeting in September. Uh, next slide. I think that switches us to the panel. Um, I will introduce Trina then as the executive director of CPRND, and she's going to be our panel, our panel um, moderator, and she will be um, engaging our, our panelists. I will pass it also to Laura if she wants to go over some housekeeping before we start. Wonderful, thank you, Colin. Um, just a couple quick uh, reminders. Um, if you have question and answer, or questions for the panel, please uh, feel welcome to put those in the Q&A box. We have had um, many coming in already, so we really appreciate that. So please uh, don't hesitate to put your questions in and we'll get as many of them answered as possible. Um, and just due to the size, we will not be unmuting uh, lines for uh, direct questions. Unfortunately, we just have so many people on, um, but please utilize that Q&A. And uh, as Colin said, I will now turn it over to Tarina. So here you go. Hello, everybody. Thank you, first of all, to our um, panelists for joining us today. And mostly also thank you for everyone who has um, participated in this webinar. We are thrilled uh, to have you with us. And I am um, uh, privileged to uh, be able to uh, engage our um, diverse and expert panel to uh, really help us uh, understand how we can work together in this um, space. There are you know, many challenges, but also uh, this unique partnership and program off affords opportunities for solutions as well. Uh, so as um, mentioned earlier, I am um, uh, at CPATH. I work um, on the um, critical path for rare neurodegenerative disease team. I lead two consortia, our Huntington's consortium and our ataxia consortium. And and I will um, take sort of the, uh, the symphony director role in bringing your questions to our panelists. Um, so I think next we're going to do um, an introduction to the um, uh, different panelists so you can get a perspective of um, their diverse perspectives. And then we will um, start off with the question and answer system. Good morning. My name is uh, Michelle Campbell, and I am the Associate Director for Stakeholder Engagement and Clinical Outcomes in the Office of Neuroscience, which is in the Office of New Drugs in CEDAR. And I thank everyone who has joined us today, and I look forward to our conversation. I'm Celia Witten. I'm the Deputy Director of the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, and I'm also the Acting Director of the Office of Therapeutic Products, where gene therapy and cell therapy are regulated. Walter, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi. I'm Walter Koroshes. I'm the director of the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, and happy to be here. Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Boak, and I work for the pharmaceutical company Roche, but I also serve as the industry co-director of the Huntington's Disease Regulatory Science Consortium, which we um, shortened to HD Risk. Very pleased to be on this panel. Hello, I'm uh, Ron Bartek. I'm a co-founder and president of the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance. I'm uh, absolutely thrilled to be participant in today's discussion. Looking forward to everyone's comments. I'll say also that we're thrilled to have been a very active um, participant in the CPATH uh, 
Rare Disease Cures Accelerator data and analytics platform, and we're looking forward to helping others participate uh, to the same extent. Thank you. Hi, I'm Philip Green. I'm a ALS patient diagnosed in August of 2018. Uh, and I'm very excited to be participating in this and the collaboration that I'm seeing between regulators, scientists, and people with lived experience in not only ALS, but other neurodegenerative diseases. Thank you. Wonderful. So thank you all, um, uh, all of the panelists for joining us today. As I mentioned, this is um, a carefully curated group. We want to make sure that we bring the expertise of drug developers, um, patient advocacy, individuals with lived experience, uh, because they're obviously the experts in, in um, encountering these rare diseases on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm going to go ahead and, and um, launch us into the, the question and answer section of this um, webinar. I want to start first with um, because again, we have such a wonderful um, wealth of expertise on this panel and diversity. I want to start with a question that goes to each panelist. Um, get your reactions to the background and introduction to the CPRD program that, that um, has been provided up to this point. We were um, privileged to hear from Dr. Corgan Correa and Dr. Romero in the in introduction and welcome uh, to sort of position um, this within the rare disease community. So, you know, maybe starting from there, I want to come, um, Ron, to you first. I know you you mentioned that you've been, you know, certainly a, a friend of CPATH and a collaborator with the Rare Disease Cures Accelerator data analytics platform and the and the work that it has done with FARA. Um, could you just bring your your reaction to what you've heard today and your um, you know perspective of um, you know how you've interacted with uh, the Critical Path Institute up to this point, but how this new opportunity will provide. Uh, a, a means to accelerate um, work within the Friedrichs ataxia space. As uh, Dr. Corgan Carre mentioned, there's been exciting progress recently with the um, approval of a treatment, but that does not mean our work is finished. So um, could yeah. you share what you You're think? You're gonna get me emotional right off the bat, aren't <laughs> yeah. you? Right, so um, I'll try to avoid that, but uh, it's, it's difficult. Um, yeah, so given our Friedrich's ataxia community's experience with uh, our own natural history efforts and, and CPATH, especially with the RDCA DAP, as you've mentioned. My initial impression of this uh, CPRND is that it's a fantastic opportunity for the ALS community and, and others uh, to play a central part in what I would call a dream team of the FDA, the NIH, and, and CPATH and their patients that's focused on accelerated development of powerful natural history data. Um, my hopes and expectations, as you asked, are that they that additional community and, and others take full advantage of that opportunity. Just a, a few quick notes about our uh, nat natural history journey. It began about 20 years ago. Um, we designed our own natural history study around the, the crying need to develop clinical outcome measures endpoints so we could conduct uh, clinical trials for the first time in our disease. And of course, when you design your own natural history study, you run the obvious risk of the data being in your own private language, so to speak, and not well understood or considered uh, reliable by others, including the regulators. However, we had the very good fortune of working very early on with our dear friends and colleagues um, like Walter at the NIH Neurological Institute in developing what were called right away common data elements across our disease and uh, various other diseases so that at least the, the data points were being reported in a, in a common language. Um, and uh, we also got uh, early on uh, or at, a little bit later, we our clinicians were um, uh, entering uh, digitally uh, generated data from uh, our, this natural history study that we be, began to uh, uh, undertake. Um, and, and they entered those 
di digital common data elements, for example, in a, in a standardized template uh, at a central location. So there again, uh, underpinnings of, of more reliability. Later, those same clinicians were award, awarded an FDA grant like the ones uh, now being provided to ALS and the other neurodegenerative disease groups to extend our natural history study, in our case, to children in the earlier stages of disease, which were underreported on and understudied. Um, it's been a, a vital element uh, of adding to our natural history database. We then became one of the first groups to participate fully in the RDCA DAP by conforming our natural history data to a standardized format and placing all of our data on the platform. In, in uh, subsequent discussions with CPATH and the FDA, it was clear we were developing a greater mutual understanding of and appreciation for the quality, interpret and interpretability, and reliability of all those natural history data. We were also thrilled to see the formation of the public-private partnership recently described by Colin and others, the critical path to therapeutics for the ataxias. Um, this is clearly going to enable the inclusion of data from the other ataxias that will greatly enrich our understanding across diseases and will greatly enrich our Friedrich's ataxia database with the inclusion of conformed natural history data on our patients not previously enrolled in our own natural history database, especially those in Europe. Um, that's something we've been working towards for years, uh, from the early days. We said, can't we get those natural history data conform to the same standards so we can begin to uh, reap the benefits of that uh, common uh, natural history database? Um, so, um, it's become increasingly clear to us that this collaborative effort has uh, greatly enhanced the value and, and potential impact of our natural history data. And it's helped put the data into a language that the FDA knows and understands and knows it uh, can rely on. Um, there can be no doubt, for example, that this was all of great benefit to our patient community when the first pharma sponsor to have submitted a new drug application uh, to the FDA and uh, in, in midpoint of, of its FDA review, um, that sponsor was able to use our natural history data available on the RDCA DAP to provide compelling confirmatory evidence that was clearly a significant factor leading to the announcement. And this is where I'll <clears throat> try to avoid emotion. Um, the announcement on Rare Disease Day two weeks ago uh, at the NIH Rare Disease Day, uh, the first FDA approval of a treatment for our disease. So we'd like to, I'd like to conclude by applauding the FDA, the NIH, CPATH, and the ALS community for coming together in the CPRND to greatly enhance the power of natural history data in ALS and other rare neurodegenerative diseases. So thank you. And thank you so much, Ron, for, for sharing that perspective, because I do think it's an ideal, um, tangible demonstration of, um, again, how we're able to use this um, collaborative effort uh, to advance um, um, uh, progress for Friedrich's ataxia. But we're now in this um, launching stage for um, these similar efforts for ALS. And that's where I want to bring the question over to Phil. Phil, you are um, you know, an individual with lived experience with, with ALS. From your perspective, and you've been very active um, in the ALS um, community, uh, and and you've you know been um, you know per, you know working in this space, seeing um, the perspective of of different groups. Um, how do you see this uh, inflection point we are at for ALS? All uh, right, I'm driving with my eyes, so. Um... I think um, Ron's description of his ex experience working with CPAT gives me so much hope because for the last, I would say four and a half years of my advocacy and involvement in ALS research and clinical trial design 
I've seen so many efforts that are trying to move the needle, but they are all so disconnected and fragmented. Uh, and I see the coming together of this collaboration of regulatory science and um, basic bench science to advance therapeutic development for our disease as a accelerator. And uh, some of the challenges that I've seen are, are we measuring the right um, outcome measures and looking at the right endpoints? And I see this as an opportunity to formalize what outcome measures can be developed and should be used in clinical trials and drug development in ALS and other neurodegenerative diseases. Um, I've been pounding the table for certain biomarkers and having FDA and other regulators at the table in the discussion of the science of these biomarkers, I think is so beneficial in getting them uh, recognized as true markers of disease progression, as opposed to anecdotes to the trial evidence. So um, I am so encouraged as someone that has spent their last four and a half years uh, trying to fix what I thought was broken in our disease as far as understanding the basic signs to inform clinical trial design so that we can uh, effectively measure whether a, um, a therapy is hitting its target or not. And ultimately, this is gonna benefit us because it's all about getting access to therapies that work and getting them to the people that need them as soon as possible. So I see this as a, not a step, but a giant two-footed leap forward towards that goal. Absolutely. And, and thank you so much, Phil, for, for that, because I think, um, as, you, as you mentioned, this is an opportunity for us all to come together so that instead of just taking small incremental steps forward, we can be more efficient and, and accelerate the process. Um, with that, I want to bring uh, the, the question then to Dr. Boak, um, because I think that's a, a great response to, you know, the um, a perspective that that you and Ron uh, just gave us in terms of you know the importance and the need for um, a, a, an effort like this within the um, community of individuals who who live with these diseases, uh, Dr. Boak, um, as a you know a expert scientist in um, in the pharmaceutical industry working on developing drugs for rare diseases, how do you? Um, uh, see some of the points that, that Ron and Phil made about, you know, improving um, therapeutic target engagement, clear answers in, um, in what we measure and, and, have, and setting ourselves up for more success. And, and how, how does this effort, from your perspective, um, accelerate that process? Thank you, Tarina. I couldn't have said it better than, than Ron and Phil already, like outlining you know, the challenges that we're all facing. We're all trying to um, you know, get potential um, therapies to patients as soon as we can, but there's things that we need to do along the way. And what better way to do it than in partnership? And like in rare diseases, it's even more important that we do. And I think the critical path um, is a um, public um, partnership, private partnership that really facilitates this, this unique forum where um, different industry groups or different companies and patient organizations and researchers uh, can come together and that doesn't exist really in um, 
in and, and other areas to support the development of these tools that are needed. Um, and I, I can give examples in, um, in, in the Huntington space in, um, the, uh, in HD Risk, which was formed just over uh, just under five years ago, um, um, uh, together with the Critical Path and CHDI Foundation working together, and that kickstarted a lot of wonderful work. And one of the accomplishments so far to exemplify the value of, um, of uh, the Critical Path Initiative is the, um, the, the development of what, um, the HDIFS. Now, this is a Huntington's Disease Integrated Staging System. And what this does is to help, um, it, what this does is characterizes um, the, the spectrum of, um, of Huntington's individuals with Huntington's over the course of their life, uh, over uh, the course of life, uh, their life, uh, lifetime. And this really helps um, put marks along the way of like what, what type of um, data and what type of assessments are needed to help um, uh, characterize at, at different stages in the disease and then that leads to um, ability to develop tools to uh, for in clinical trials and ultimately to um, and that will ultimately help support um, drug um, approvals um, in HD and this is just a, um, this particular tool that has been developed um, in under the um, in the HD risk um, framework it wouldn't have been able, it wouldn't have been able to be done in such a, 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 an efficient way without the, the the close interaction and a, engagement um, that the critical path in, uh, facilitated with the FDA, but also bringing together the different companies and researchers have been interested in this uh, in dealing with this challenge. It's often the case is that there'll be multiple companies working on. Is having you know these challenges and these questions and having these individual conversations with the FDA around how to do this and how to move um, something forward or like to identify how to 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 do something for a drug development program and it can be not so efficient if there's five different conversations happening and uh, not efficient from the individual company's standpoint but not from the FDA the agencies but also the patients and organizations are also being consulted um, in parallel so I think some of these points were brought up with class at the beginning as well just the efficiencies that this can provide um, this forum is just very valuable for everybody involved including companies like Roche. Well, thank you, Dr. Book, for first of all, for um, you know the the leadership that you bring to our um, Huntington's Disease Consortium efforts, and then also for sharing that perspective because I um, certainly think that it's relevant for for you know of course what we're the efforts that we're um, pursuing in Huntington's disease, but this is a playbook that can absolutely be leveraged for other diseases as we're speaking about for you know, Friedrich's ataxia, ALS, others. Um, I want to now move to Dr. Koroshetz. Uh, you know, as we mentioned, this is a, a, a sort of a dream team. I think Ron was the one who who coined. And um, the, the idea that, that you know, those who are part of this effort are, are a dream team. So Dr. Koroshetz, could you um, please share your perspective of, of how uh, the, the role that, um, that the NIH is playing in this, in this important partnership and how this really does help us um, work together to achieve greater success? Well, thank you very much, Trina. And um, I have one disclosure to make. Both Ron and I are big dreamers. <laughs> So, uh, but let me give you three reasons why I think this is really, really important um, and why we're super excited to partner um, with the FDA and CPAP and, and the patients and the industry and the academics to kind of bring everything together focused on developing more effective treatments for these rare neurodegenerative diseases. I, before I came to NIH, I took care of patients with Huntington's for about 20 years. So anything that we can do to, get really good treatments for that disease would be fantastic. And, and ALS, uh, we just finished our strategic planning with ALS. And the first thing to say is that, you know, as Phil said, and everybody came in, they looked at what was going on in ALS. And one of the conclusions was it's all fractured, all this good stuff no one knows about. And, and there's so much more ammunition to be brought to the fight if we can bring it all together. So I think that public private partnership is really going to allow us to do that. And I must say that this is all made possible by the accelerated access to critical treatments for ALS bill that the president signed in 2021, which afforded really substantial funds to do expanded access research, but also to build this public-private partnership. And that funding to the NIH, we think, is really going to 
um, allow us to do things in, in these diseases that we never would really be able to do without it. So hats off to the people who helped get that through. Um, I guess the second thing I wanted to say is that if you think about getting effective treatments for people, there are these multiple stages, and I'm going to simplify it, but NIH is generally in that very early stage where we're trying to understand, you know, the mechanism of the disease, the basic biology of, say, motor neurons, and that leads to targets that usually industry then picks up to try to figure out how to develop drugs. And we'll work at the NI space to develop, say, biomarkers of pathology, say like neurofilament light, a, a, a marker of uh, neurodegeneration, or things that are closer to the disease, like HTTT, the aggregates in Huntington's disease you can see in the spinal fluid, or synuclein aggregates you can see in the spinal fluid. And then those things are used primarily in the phase two space to develop a treatment and then see if it's really doing what you think it's doing. But then NIH is pretty much out of the game and industry takes it and they're working with patients and their goal is to bring something and have within a really good package to the FDA. And, and so that link uh, has never really been formulated, put together like it really should be. So this is a great opportunity to kind of just stretch across that chain from the very early studies to the FDA approval side. And, and that I think will, will inform everybody in, in the, in, on those chain links as we move forward and make it a, a much stronger chain. So in, in that respect with the public private partnership, um, we're also working with the foundation for NIH to build what's called an accelerated medicine partnership. And that is something that is earliest stage. It's basically focused on developing biomarkers, new targets, uh, informing industry folks on what they can pursue going into drug development. Um, but it's, it's really, it would be separate from what the FDA does. But now with CPATH involved in this public part partnership, the chain is established right across. And so I think a lot of the things that, that is, is discovered in the CPATH analysis of the data will have that same data in, in the FNIH portal. Uh, and those biological markers, whether they're transcriptomics or proteomics or genetics, I think could, could, it's going to help uh, everybody in, in this effort. Um, and then I guess the third thing is that, and I alluded to this already, is that you, know, you would think in the government you would have all these people talking together and working together. And you know, it's really true. That's what we should do. Um, that's not always what we do. And, and so this is a great example of doing what we should do. And, and hopefully that will scale up to, to multiple other disorders over time and, and help us to you know, really make progress for the people who either have the disease, they're suffering now, they're caregivers, but also the people who are at risk for developing this, these diseases you know, in the future. And uh, so I'm really excited about this and it's gonna take Everyone, you know, all hands on deck. So the data now is with the patient organizations, much of it, some of with NIH. We're going to be setting up a consortium that will do expanded access research, but we'll also be doing the data collection to bring, to understand the biomarkers, understand the natural history of the disease, the, the different heterogeneity in the disease. And so I think we have an opportunity to really make a big difference in ALS. Uh, and the other rare neurogenic diseases through this public private partnership. So couldn't be more excited about it. And thank you, Dr. Korshitz, for, for giving us that, that perspective, because I think it is, as you mentioned, really important to understand um, we, we, all, you know, we all intend and want to work together and speak to each other, but this provides us exactly those channels to do that to greater effect. And so, um, as, as you mentioned, uh, you know, it's, it's really important for, for and we've, we've reinforced um, through um, all of our um, conversations up to this point, how this is um, a great opportunity to bring everyone together. Um, I want to hear from our colleagues um, at the, the FDA, but I also I, I want to um, ask them to provide additional clarification. Um, first of all, we're you know obviously excited about how we're working together, but I think we could we could benefit from some clarification about when um, uh, interest, interested parties should use the the standard um, um, FDA mechanisms and where the particular unique partnership of the CPR and D initiative. Um, comes into play. So um, I want to come to Michelle first, and or Dr. Campbell, and then uh, Dr. Witten um, will um, uh, come to your perspective, and then we'll move on to some questions from um, uh, the participants of the webinar. Well, thank you, Trina, and I want to 
Thank everyone for joining this morning. I want to thank Ron and Phil for their opening remarks really into this panel discussion. Um, and I agree with you, Phil. This initiative really gives me great hope that we are we are answering this larger unmet need in rare neurogenic diseases and through working together through the uh, pre-competitive space and lessons learned from other diseases and disorders of all shapes and sizes we will better inform us on how to be able to optimize clinical trial design, endpoint selection, and even I think the bench science, as, as Walter talked about, when I was a young researcher and the concept of translational research was coming out, this bench to bedside, you know, idea, I was always on the more bedside of uh, of research, you know, and the more clinical trial research. And I always wondered about how is that link going to happen? And so I'm also very excited that we truly are bringing that entire concept of the early development that our NIH colleagues conduct and fund into bringing into a uh, beginning of a pipeline that a, a industry person can pick up that work and then come and have those drug development or biological to my CBER colleagues, um, potential uh, therapeutic intervention and come have conversations with us and advice on how to develop that clinical trial. So I think that's extremely exciting and I'm so looking forward to it. Um, and I know that we are already learned lessons from the engagement in RDC ADAP um, with, with the effort of Farah and, and Ron's work with, with contributing that data and that is helping inform um, future works and, and going forward in that area. Um, I've been fortunate to have worked with many of the Critical Path Consortium um, that Colin mentioned in one of his slides. I've seen the efforts of what the pre-competitive space can do. And by working together outside of an individual drug development program, we are able to leverage the group's knowledge of what is going on, what is the problem, and what are potential solutions to address these problems. Being, being able to bring all stakeholders um, in the room together um, and, and really collaborating is really the greatest strength of efforts like this in the pre-competitive space, um, because we can only advance the science if we work together. When we, when we work as an individual, we're not really advancing much. We may be adding a small piece to the science, but it's when we really all come together and collaborate, then we're able to make, have that momentum to advance science and learn and then disseminate to help others um, learn from the information um, that has been gleaned from these efforts. And I think what CPRD and this public private partnership offers is the best of all of these experiences that the critical path has done and the lessons learned from those past contributors and participants in pre competitive um, efforts. And I think those who of us who are here to help advise it. And um, we are also taking our lessons learned from past experiences to help really optimize and, and make sure that we are going to be able to achieve sustainable solutions and answer important questions to advance drug development or medical product development in the rare neurodegenerative diseases. And so um, to the second point to Trina's question is, how do we engage? And, and I understand this question because when we get to work in the pre-competitive space, Again, it is outside of an individual uh, drug or biologic development program. And so there, that engagement looks a little different. Um, we still are encouraged and want to hear what the, the questions are, what the unmet needs are from all stakeholders, including patients. Um, but for more formal interactions with the agency, we do have traditional pathways to engage um, with us. And so we do have patient listening sessions through our Office of Patient Affairs. Um, that will bring together all of the medical product centers and other relevant and interested FDA uh, parties to listen to um, what patients want to tell us. It is truly a listening session. The topics vary. We learn so much, though, during these sessions. They're about an hour and a half. Um, but it's really usually a lot of times the first time maybe a patient group has engaged with the agency in some way. And so it's sometimes a foundational piece of just explaining the disease what the burden of the disease is and what the unmet needs are. Another option is through our patient-focused drug development initiatives. Um, and what we really have seen in the boom um, in the last, I would say, five years is the hosting of externally led patient-focused drug development meetings that all of the medical product centers take part in. Um, and there is a formal process um, on the FDA's website on how to initiate that. Um, and the FDA, if selected, uh, works with that patient group and guides them in development of that agenda for the meeting. 
again, I would say it's a much longer patient listening session meeting, and we truly are there to listen and we gleam a lot of information. Oftentimes from that meeting, uh, a report called the Voice of the Patient Report is developed um, by those who hosted the meeting, and they do submit it and it is publicly posted on the FDA's website. A lot of times we get questions about, well, FDA, what do you do with this information? And I will say that we do go back and look at those voice of the patient reports. If we're in the middle of a drug review or providing advice in an I, in a IND setting, we do go back and listen to it. I often tell patient groups that sometimes it may not be easy to see what, how we use this information immediately, um, particularly if we have an active drug development uh, program going on because we have to wait to the end of the review um, on how that's informed and that can take time. But I do assure you that we are listening to you and we do take back and we are often re reflecting on what we have heard in those meetings. And additionally, both, and I would say finally, both um, CEDAR and CBER have um, at their central, center levels ways to engage um, through different mechanisms. Um, and, and in CEDAR, we have our patient affairs and stakeholder engagement staff. Um, and I know Dr. Whitten will talk about, can mention what CBER's mechanism is. So there's multiple ways for engagement with the agency. Um, it has to make sense. Um, and then again, um, for our industry members, they would they do know this, that if they want to come and, and start engaging with us on a drug development program or a medical product program, I should say, that um, they should always come early and have these conversations with us in terms of optimizing trial design, endpoint selection, what are you trying to do? And so those are definitely more formal, and, and obviously we have guidance on what that looks like. Um, but um, we do have both the opportunities to engagement uh, through the FDA, um, which can help inform our everyday work and also um, opportunities as we continue to roll out CPR and D with engagement opportunities. And those will continue to emerge over time as we move this initiative forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Campbell, for you know giving us that perspective, um, helping us to understand where where this um, partnership fits in with CPR and D, and where um, groups would 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 benefit from um, pursuing the you know these other standard uh, mechanisms through the FDA. And as you mentioned, you know you um, certainly sit within CBDUR, which is the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Dr. Witten is within CBUR, which is the Center for Biological Biologics Evaluation and Research. Dr. Witten, is there an additional um, you know point of emphasis from from, from your side of, of the FDA that you'd like to share um, with uh, our, our attendees um, of this, um, this uh, webinar uh, so that we can make sure that we understand the distinctions, both how, how the, the two sides of the FDA work together and then where they have maybe some separate roles. Yes, well, I think that um, Michelle already went over you know, many of the mechanisms that we have that we do jointly, and I really don't want to repeat those. We also have a um, stakeholder uh, patient engagement um, lead in our center too. And we sometimes will meet with stakeholder with patient groups who want to just understand, they want to meet informally and just understand what we do in a given area. So we occasionally do that. Um, we prefer if it, there's a disease area that it's multiple groups at a time. Um, but I do want to comment on just the general question of what kinds of things someone might want or patient or patient group might want to address through the CPRD versus FDA. And I think the CPRD, which is, is, I really have a lot of optimism for the future that this will be an extremely helpful initiative, uh, bringing stakeholders together. I think that is aimed at things like identifying gaps in the data and the science and engaging dialogue as to how to develop solutions. And obviously patient groups have a, have a voice in that and they should have a voice in that. So I think for those kinds of things, they do want to contact the CPRD. Other things that are more like what Michelle was describing about patients lived experiences, either with the disease or the abuse on risk benefit or caregivers, those are more addressed by the kind of mechanisms that she mentioned and I'll just put in a plug while you know while we're on this webinar um, that you know one aspect, just as an example, we're interested in is patients' experiences in clinical trials because a clinical trial needs to be scientifically de designed, but it also has to be feasibly designed for the patient. And we're having a a um, 
workshop on April 13th on uh, gene therapy and patients' experiences in clinical trials. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the exact title. But that kind of thing would be more FDA rather than CPRND. Although I'm sure there's a lot of topics that there's overlap. So I don't think there's a neat bucket. But anyway, that's my general view about the difference. Thank you so much, and, and I thank you all for um, providing this this perspective. Because again, it's um, uh, you know, really important for us to understand uh, the, the different uh, you know expertise perspectives and and how each of these different organizations and stakeholders can come together to enhance the success. I think now to kind of pivot this because we're getting a lot of great questions from um, participants. Um, taking the the sort of you know baseline that we've just established um, in this discussion so far, um, I think many people because we're kind of consolidating this into um, a question that, that really reflects a lot of feedback from, from the, um, the feedback we're getting in, in the chat. Um, many people are wondering how their particular rare disease fits into this CPRND dream team um, mechanism. Um, because I think that that's, you know, clearly, uh, you know, a, 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 an un, um, unanswered or open question for many and uh, next steps would um, be of, of keen interest. So, you know, understanding what the, the role the patient experience data can play in development um, of drug development tools and regulatory review um, and how individual uh, unique rare diseases can can get into this um, this effort. I want to start first with Colin uh, to, you know, really help us understand um, what what that that playbook looks like. Um, I first of all, I you know, want to echo the team is, you know, is very open to discussing initial initial conversations about other disease states. Um, you know, we're we're going to provide during the course of of this webinar multiple ways for outreach and to connect with us. Um, what we'll be doing uh, every six months is trying to look at where our portfolio of projects can expand. So, you know, those conversations will help us in a sense, create an on-ramp and a, in a, in a, in a runway for, for new efforts that we can move into. One of the areas that's really promising for us to generate quick wins in this space is if there's existing data and sharing data. I don't know if Alex is still on the call, but if he wants to add any additional comments about this. We, um, we have this effort under, going on currently, and I mentioned it in the slides, where we generate these task groups. The task groups are really designed to be a rapid startup initiative that will focus on a key scientific question and the product by which is a drug development tool. Um, we hope that this will be one way by which that we can explore new areas and then also identify unmet needs as we begin to look at the data that's in that ecosystem. Um, you know, we see a lot of opportunities there. The bottom line, I'd like to reinforce that this is CPAP is here for you. Um, I took this job as a clinician. You know, my my near and dear, my background is, you know, I, I got into research largely out of my own frustrations. I think that is echoed by many people at CPAP and many of the panelists that you're you're listening to today from the respective stakeholders. So, you know, reach out. Like I said, be loud, be selfish. Um, we want to really hear, you know, from you and 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 begin to figure out ways that we can collaborate. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hovinge. Uh, just want to see if um, if if we what if there's an additional um, component of this uh, of the answer to this question um, from uh, our colleagues at the at the FDA. Dr. Campbell, do you have um, an additional um, nuance there? Yeah, I think it's really important, um, and I think it's a great question. First of all, <clears throat> and I don't think um, I should say I think where we want to do is as as Colin has said is where can we start right now immediately, right? And immediately is through what existing data that we have that can come and help. And so a, a conversation I know that I've been having a lot more recently when I present is talking about why it's important um, to leverage existing data to help us answer these areas of unmet need. And by going through and examining it and running analytics and, and, and really looking at where are the gaps and holes 
um, can help us answer a lot more questions that way, um, such as maybe I'm missing capturing uh, an important concept that, that patients talk about that we're actually not capturing that actually may be something that is better to measure uh, to support a clinical trial endpoint. So I, I've continually for the last couple of years, if you've seen me talk, I've, I often talk about data sharing and the rare disease cures data and analytics platform. Um, that initiative was set up to be um, not disease specific. It was meant to be disease agnostic to bring in all sorts of data. And I think um, Ron's experience with that really shows what happens when one patient group can contribute data when pulled with other data sets that had been contributed in uh, Friedrichs to, to really help inform the areas of unmet need. So I think uh, right now, some of the low hanging fruits is what existing data we have, how to encourage others to think about it and, and, in, and, in the, and, and really leveraging the power <clears throat> of RDC ADAP and optimizing data collection. Um, I also think leveraging the, these experiences and looking at, you know, can we start looking at maybe families of diseases, things of that nature. We understand that that will be something more over time um, that we can try to explore. But I think there's some exciting opportunities with ways of leveraging prior information. I don't want that to though, scare those who say, but we're so small and tiny, we don't have a lot of data. It does not matter. I think any amount of data is important. Contribute it because perhaps it can be pooled with something that may be similar to look at phenotypes and similar features that when we would approach a clinical trial design can be informative. Um, I also, this is when we say to our colleagues who are in drug development, why it's important to come talk to us early, why it's important to come talk to us about when you may come in for your, you know, your pre-IND meeting and you think you're just going to talk about the safety and the non-clinical stuff, but starting that conversation of what you envision those future um, trials to be actually could be a really important time to really have us think with you about what kind of advice we can provide on how to optimize that clinical trial design. How can we optimize what we're going to measure, um, the length of the trial, all of those little nuances, and it's all based on the evidence and information we have at that time. So I can't give specifics of what it could look like, but that's why we actually do encourage it. And we really do mean it because early engagement can really help in those continued conversations with your respective therapeutic review division if you are in drug development is critical in, in really moving things forward and allows us also to bring in our internal experts um, that we may have in other areas to, to also get their ideas and thoughts. So I think this is a really exciting time. I think <clears throat> we want to make sure that all stakeholders are brought to the table and, um, I, and continue to encourage. And I think when we meet again and, and, and discuss more of these, I think we'll be able to see and, evolve, and show how we can evolve um, with some of these efforts as we move forward. Um, so I think that's what I have for right now, Tarina. I'm not sure if Dr. Whitten has anything to add, although I see that Colin and Ron have some hands up as well. <laughs> yeah, and, and thank you, Dr. Campbell. Um, uh, I do want to come back to Ron because I think that he's, you know, again, reacting to a lot of what we're saying here and, and giving us that that in real time um, perspective. So, so please go ahead. Okay, uh, yeah, I just want to reinforce several things that Michelle just uh, so adroitly stated. One is to emphasize, as she did, how much we learn about our own disease uh, in our participation in the RDC ADAP. I mean, the analysts there and at the FDA have helped us understand our and how best better to refine our endpoints, how to better design clinical trials. And if you go to the clinical trial modeling platform in which we're not quite there yet uh, with the RDC ADAP, but hope to be soon. I mean, Bill, you can imagine how much help you, uh, your community is going to get from that platform to design clinical trials most, most effectively. Um, and, you know, so, and, and you're also able to learn so much about other closely related diseases. And, you know, they're doing some tremendous work that's called ontology uh, in looking at all the symptoms and all the, the factors and, and, uh, and other diseases and drawing those filaments, connective tissue between diseases and among diseases to see how you could maybe learn from the endpoints that they've developed if, 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 if they have a similar symptom and so forth. So there's just, it's just a powerful, powerful tool 
uh, that can bring it all together uh, for all of us. And we learn a whole lot from each other and how better to uh, advance our, our own research. So spot on Michelle Campbell as always. <laughs> And thank you, Ron, for, for that perspective. And yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Campbell, as well. Uh, Dr. Kovinge, do you do you want to yeah, uh, wrap that up? There's, yeah, there's there's one thing I wanted to echo from, you know, then expand upon what Michelle had mentioned is that, you know, we work and collaborate with multiple rare disease groups currently. Um, many of them, have, you know, represent a diverse landscape from like, we're really trying to, you know, orient ourselves. We may be ultra rare all the way to more established groups that have, have really you know, got an extensive database and, and you know, it's all created and everything. The, the beauty of, of this initiative and the, the philosophy that we have at Critical Path is that we don't expect things to come in a neat tied up bow. Um, you know, we have regular meetings um, ongoing and to discuss you know, how to move forward in, with, with different patient groups because they may not have the expertise to, to understand, you know, about how to plan their registry or whatnot, how to aggregate the data, how to, you know, what's capable and, and whatnot. So, you know, really, as you, as you get our contact information, take us up on the invitation, reach out, talk to us. I mean, you know, the, the enemy of progress is perfect, right? I mean, so, you know, don't be afraid to, to reach out and, and to, to really, you know, act and, and, you know, we'll help us help you. And, and I, I want you to really hear that, please. Thank you for that. And, and now coming to some um, additional questions that we're getting, and thank you everybody for sharing your questions. This has been, you know, really um, exciting to see the, the engagement and enthusiasm in this space. Um, we're, there are a couple of uh, questions that are coalescing around disease families, and that's something we can come to in, in a bit, how we can share learnings. Um, very efficiently. And there's also some questions that have come in that I'm kind of consolidating into um, a question that I'm going to bring to uh, our um, experts from uh, the FDA. Uh, we've talked about optimizing what we measure. We've talked about optimizing um, clinical trials for success, but um, a lot of um, um, uh, concern and, and focus in the rare disease space is on how to specifically optimize clinical trial design to address some of the the acute challenges um, that uh, that you know are um, experienced by um, participants in the trials and also those who um, drug developers who are enrolling the trial. Uh, Dr. Witten, could you speak to um, you know, I know we can't use a one size fits all, but can you speak to um, a few uh, uh, notions that that um, would really help those um, from the rare disease community who are asking questions around um, how clinical trials can be optimized um, for better success? Um, well, it, it, you could be asking any one of a number of things, but but some of what you're touching on is what this uh, webinar of ours, I think is, or workshop is aimed at, which is to look at it from the patient's point of view. What are some of the things that enable patients or their families to participate in the trial? There's a lot of people with rare diseases. There, there could be multiple factors that make it hard for them to get to the clinic, to get data gathered, to, um, you know, really even enroll, you know, just the, even going through enrollment. One of the things we've done is encourage our sponsors to consult with patient groups and consult with patients. Um, I think for big companies generally know how to do that or they're used to doing that, but smaller sponsors have less of an understanding of how they might uh, follow that advice. So I, I think you're raising, or whoever raises questions is raising a good question. Um, sometimes I've wondered whether we you know, ought to consider or someone should consider what are best practices for small sponsors trying to engage patient groups at the design stage of their trial. Although I'm not sure that's within the scope of what, um, you know, this consortium is doing. If, if it is, it would certainly be worth discussing. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Campbell, is there anything else you want to add from the perspective of, of clinical trial innovation that, that you all at the agency think about whenever um, groups come to you planning a rare disease trial? Yes, um, we are constantly thinking about this. Um, we are open to a lot of, to all proposals. You know, a, a sponsor can come in and 
propose something to us and we'll review it based on the evidence that's submitted with that proposal and then provide advice on what, what we think of that proposal. Um, and obviously we have opportunities um, through our complex innovative uh, drug development program or CID program, you know, is one way we're, we're definitely very open to, to looking at ways to optimize trials in many ways. And I think optimization can look very different um, to different diseases, disorders, trial designs, um, what do we know, what, what the treatment could be. Um, and so I think, as Dr. Witten said, we have to talk to patients to, to learn a little bit more about where are their barriers? Is it a recruitment issue and there's, there's problems traveling? Um, is it on optim optimizing where can we do remote visits um, for some of these? Um, is it optimizing where we um, think about a statistical an, uh, analysis plan that will allow us to look at a, a different a, a subpopulation of the trial design? So I think this is why we, we talk about that early engagement. We really mean it because this is when we're going to try to work together to optimize any trial. I would say we, we always are doing that. We're always trying to find that optimized trial design in our everyday work, right? Because we do want to see success. Um, I do want to highlight um, that in when we published our action plan last June and in our science strategy, um, we did want to, we did talk about describing, looking at a little bit in decentralized trials and use, in the use of digital health technologies, perhaps to assist that. And the FDA um, is funding work, um, and we described this work actually at FDA Rare Disease Day, to, to look at a remote administration and a standardized method of um, starting first with the ALS FRS. And um, that is an ongoing effort um, where we're looking at that administration and what is it really to be successful. And we're trying to really incorporate the broad population um, of ALS patients. We understand that, you know, most folks that are in a clinical trial are going to a large academic center and, and that's not where they live. They live maybe somewhere else far away. And so I am optimistic that if this is successful, while it was in ALS, we can take the lessons learned and be able to deploy quickly into trial advice for other rare diseases on approaches of how to do this. So again, optimizing trials, I think, is always at the forefront of the advice we provide. And um, we are always engaged to have these conversations on how that can be done in a, in, a, in a rigorous way so we can interpret the data in the end. Thank you so much for, for, for that perspective, because I think, you know, it, this is really the, the next steps and, and the, the, direct, the trajectory that so many um, um, groups who are trying to advance their clinical trials and rare disease need to go. Um, I want to now bring us to a question that, uh, again, it's coming to some, you know, pulling together a couple of different questions around um, certainly acknowledging that rare disease, you know, as um, uh, Dr. Romero mentioned in the introduction, there are, you know, many individual rare diseases, but all together, it, it you know, has an amplified voice. Um, we need to balance both where we can share learnings and generalize and where we need to be very specific in the one size doesn't fit all category. So I want to bring a question to Dr. Hovinga about how, um, you know, maybe looking at this more generalized and shared learnings component, um, how we can um, really use the, the data platform and um, the efforts within this space for, um, you know, broader efforts across diseases for um, core data and metadata sets. Um, thank you. The, you know, the, that's exactly, you know, expands a little bit on Ron's discussion. I think the beauty of having a multiple rare diseases housed together in CPATH gives a lot of shared learnings. You know, um, I think the other part of this is that, you know, patient data is something that CPATH, you know, really wants to receive from the patient community and, and ultimately use that for the drug development tools. I think by using things like ontology that, that Ron had noted is, is that by you can reach across disease states, even in preclinical, you know, pre-human studies to determine new areas and hypotheses and relationships that are, are you know, that could benefit ultimately drug development. Um, so, you know, that, that data, you know, can be multiple formats and, and whatnot. I mean, we, we will selfishly take your data um, because we, we, we can use it. But I also want to pause a bit and also echo that, you know, we're in a larger conversation with NIH and FINH about how to harmonize data between our two groups so that we're all sharing the same data resources so that it's not, if you go to one portal, you're getting a different set of data. 
you know, and whatnot. So, you know, there'll be more to come. CPAP will access the same data set as, 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 as NIH is doing. Um, but the, you know, the initiative that, that Walter discussed is really part of this just bigger umbrella of connectivity that we hope to achieve in this partnership. And I'll, I'll, I'll let Walter add to that. So I'm not just the only one speaking on the, con on the, the, the question. No, I to totally agree, Colin. And um, this is a really unique opportunity to, as I said before, to connect these two chains of uh, of work. And uh, and and I think we're going to be a lot, a lot stronger for bringing this preclinical data, this biologic data from patients, uh, develop biomarkers that can be tested as proof of principle or target engagement in early phase two trials, and and then. You know, learn from that on, on how to move things, you know, su more successfully um, to uh, create benefit for patients and approval by the FDA. And I, I think just that I'll add to that discussion is, is that the beauty of this collaboration is that the existing data is something that CPATH can work across multiple natural history studies, you know, clinical trial data registries to synthesize solutions. But also say to you know and, and work with Walter's group to say okay these are where we see the gaps you know these are the things that are, are stopping points when we've looked at this data and you know and the NIH really to raise the the torch to say okay we're going to look here now and I and I think that that's that's the beauty of this um, paradigm and and I, I think you're going to see a lot of promising you know outcomes from this this collaboration. Thank you both, uh, Dr. Hovinge and Dr. Korshitz, for, for that perspective. I want to bring us to a, a specific question. And this is going to be a question that I want to bring to each panelist, because as we mentioned at the opening, all of you have a, a specific perspective um, within this broader um, uh, partnership and ecosystem. Um, thinking about how we move forward together, um, what would you see as a specific measure of success? Again, all of you have a different perspective. Um, what would be a specific uh, tangible demonstration of success of this effort? I wanna try to do this rapid fire because I wanna make sure we get to everybody. Um, so, but I'm gonna take a, a reverse order. I'm gonna, going to, um, I wanna end with um, our individuals who live, uh, you know, have the perspective of caregivers and, and living with the disease at, for the punctuation mark at the end. Um, so maybe I'll start first um, Dr. Hovinge with you, because you can kind of bring the program perspective, and then we'll move, um, you know, to our drug developers, to our regulators, and, and end with our um, individuals with lived experience. I'm going to go with the composite endpoint. <laughs> you know? um, I think it's number of lives impacted is, is the thing that really um, is my hope is if we can measure the number of lives impacted. I think the, in ancillary is the number of, of trials that use the tools that we, we have. The third is, is really the number of drug approvals that ultimately reach the market. And the last part is, do we create a model that could be emulated across multiple disease states that works with this, these, these stakeholders to really um, be more strategic about how we approach scientific drug development interactions? And so that's my, that's my composite endpoint. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Korshitz, what would you add um, uh, from, from your perspective for you, what you see as um, a, a metric of success from this effort? Um, well, I've been around a long time, and so there's only one thing I really want, and that's really effective treatments. So I'd like to reproduce we have in spinal muscular atrophy, where babies were treated, and they were going to die within a year, and now five years later, they're not they don't need a ventilator, they're walking, and the motor neurons are working. So that's that's the goal. Thank you for that. I wanna to come to you next, Dr. Boak, um, because that kind of positions us to, you know, how can um, individuals like you and groups, uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies who are in this space, you know, fighting the fight to improve these um, treatments and therapeutics and bring, bring novelty and success to this effort, what would you see you know, as as something uh, that we could look back on later and and um, acknowledge a success from this effort. I would say that lessons that we could learn across diseases lead to more more efficient 
um, drug development programs and then ultimately more more um, um, access to these treatments for patients. I mean, if we really stay true to some of the things that we've already talked about, like under this um, CPR and D umbrella, different diseases, tackling different things, there are a lot of some commonalities, there are some differences, but what can we learn from the recent successes in, uh, in Friedrich Zetaxia and ALS and uh, build upon for in the other diseases like Huntington's? That would be what I'd like. It's sort of a bit more short term, but it's certain working towards those goals that both, um, the other two panelists just outlined. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Campbell, I want to come to you next because uh, the getting the, you know, as we kind of like make this this sort of progression through this panel um, for what we see as, uh, as a successful outcome of these efforts from, from where you sit, um, what do you think would be, you know, points that we could be proud of? Your, your yeah, so I think when we look at success, we're going to be looking at maybe what is immediate, what is in the middle, and what is long-term success. So obviously for me, long-term success, I mean, to what, to what Walter said, right, approved drugs, right? We are able to add therapeutic options for clinicians and families and patients, right? And I think obviously that is what we want. We want to see success. Um, because we get sad when there's not success. <laughs> we're humans too. And so when things were like, oh no, it didn't work, we get sad. So obviously our long-term goal is how we can do that. And I do think with these early, um, with, with, with the what's happened in Friedrichs and Rett's and some other rare diseases where we're starting to see more uh, first-time therapies approved, I think that it provides hope and emerging uh, pipelines for other rare diseases. And we think we can take those lessons learned. I think some other um um, wins or what the success would be is how can we leverage existing data and how has that informed us to improve either data collection, standardization, identify gaps, are we able to build models? Um, so I think success is going to come in a lot of shapes and forms for this initiative. Um, and so I, I think we we should look at, at as those as well as what are some of things that will then eventually get us that long term goal and, and be able to impact drug development. I think that's where we also need to think about what are some of those more maybe uh, short and medium term successes that will lead us on that path. Thank you so much, because again, you know, we're capturing the, the wide breadth of, of di and, and diverse experiences of, of um, those on the panel for for their perspective. And also, Dr. Campbell, you're helping us also capture um, near term, mid term, long term. Uh, Dr. Witten, do you have uh, something to add? I mean, this is you know we're we're, it, it, we're asking for silver bullets and and um, uh, you know not and, and really you know no perfect answer, but but do you have more to um, um, provide nuance for this? Well, I just want to say, I, of course, I agree with everything people are saying about the goals, but I'm particularly glad that Walter provided the the example of spinal muscular atrophy because that approval in part hinged on the development of a motor scale that was able to capture the repertoire of motor abilities in spinal muscular atrophy one population. And the use of that to have some natural history data, I think that made it you know, much easier to figure out a path forward for that product. And so on a short-term basis, success would be ident you know, identification or development of a tool like that. Or, or or one may already exist for other diseases and use of it in natural history studies, because I think that is so key. And I, I do think that's the kind of thing that this consortium can focus on, can work on, can have successes on. So I just I just had to say that. I wasn't going to say anything, but since um since that example was provided as what we all want, I want to say this consortium has an important role and trying to make it possible to get to those kinds of uh, benefits, treatments for patients. Absolutely, thank you for, for adding that because I, I really do think it's an example of how we can you know, bring it all together and have a guiding light uh, in, in terms of something that, that we can um, you know, keep, keep our focus on and, and model for, for the efforts that we have here. To um, you know, transition us to to the wrap up. I want to you know bring this the same question, but get the perspective of our um, patient advocate advocates and individuals um, who who live the experience. Um, starting first with you, Phil. Um, you know, reacting to what you just heard um, the other panelists um, discuss as as what they would see as um, important, tangible uh, success for these efforts. What what would be um, success for you? Oh, 
Oop, we just need to get um, Phil unmuted. One second. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Technology. Yeah, I love it. Um, hang on, let me pause. My dwell. Okay. Um, success to me would be gathering enough data through natural history to better understand what we need to target. And um, boom, I think equally important um, developing tools to help us definitively know that we are hitting that target and that that therapy is effective. So a win to me from this effort is really um, being able to tell somebody this therapy helps you. And that's not through um, idea in a perfect world, not through a functional rating scale, but by looking at a biomarker that the therapy um, has an impact on. And that to me um, is probably our biggest gap in clinical drug development right now. And neurodegenerative diseases is really knowing that the therapy is doing what it's supposed to do. So I know that's kind of a pie in the sky um, uh, wish, but that would be the ultimate win for me. Excellent. Thank you so much for articulating that, um, you know, so personally and specifically um, in a way that I think really is uh, impactful to, um, of course, those of us who are um, part of this, um, this collaboration and also all of the participants of this webinar. Ron, I want to come back to you sort of as our our bookend. We started with you. We're ending with you. I mean, in terms of our panel discussion, we do have a few more um, wrap-up points that that um, okay. Dr. Havinge will take us through in just a moment. But what is uh, your perspective, Ron, for success in this effort? Well, I'm going to come down uh, on the same side that Phil just did uh, because you know, um, take for granted um, you know the wonderful success stories, the the wonderful metrics of success being. Uh, an approved treatment uh, or, you know, um, a therapy that actually works that, as Colin said, uh, how many people did you help? Um, but that, that kind of metric is um, very time consuming. I mean, it's just taken us 25 years as an organization to achieve our first approved drug. We, you know, um, so that's a tough metric. I, I'd say in the meantime, a metric is um, the kinds of relationships you've been able to build, the kinds of data you've been able to assemble, the kinds of um, dialogue you've been able to have with all the stakeholders and so that all of us are, are working together from the NIH, the FDA, the uh, pharmaceutical industry partners, uh, the patient advocacy organizations, um, all of us. Are, are, are using the same vocabulary. We, we have the same understanding. We've built enough data to understand the, um, you know, and characterize our diseases. And, and, and we're able to have genuine dialogue uh, with the same language that we're, we're speaking with each other, not at each other. Um, and we can all work together as this, this, this discussion and this program is a perfect illustration of how that can happen. We've got a lot of work to do together, but it, you know, it, what better way to begin than to be working together on, uh, in, in this wonderful dialogue with, with, with full commitment. You know, we're all in, all together, all the time. So, 
Absolutely. And thank you so much, Ron. That was perfect. I don't want to, you know, further editorialize uh, because I think that that's really the perfect place to leave this panel discussion. I want to thank every panelist for participating. Um, I want everyone to know that in addition to the, to, you know, the different perspectives that, that they were able to bring, this is a global panel. We are spanning continents, time zones, and uh, I really appreciate everybody for, for coming together um, on this discussion and, and really um, helping us to, to really provide a perspective of this program and how it can serve the many needs of the rare disease community. Um, with this, I'm gonna hand it back to Dr. Hovinge to take us through some next steps and wrap us up. Thank you, everybody. I, I wanna echo that enthusiasm. Um, I think someone wrote in the comments, you know, how you know, we need to keep in mind how this is all time sensitive. And I think everyone involved in this effort is 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 very in tune with that and, and very eager to, to move as fast as possible. Um, I wanna I wanna thank uh, Jacqueline and Klaus um, for, for for launching us in this meeting today. And I wanna thank the panelists for their involvement and their participation. Um, you know, your insight and your perspectives are are something that we value and we we Welcome to, to this family and, and collaborators. Um, what I want to talk to you a little bit about is next steps. Um, we will be sending out questions as, as an FAQ. Um, we need to get to all the questions, so you'll receive those. Um, you know, we'll send out our contact information. So if you have a disease or questions in follow-up, that you're welcome to engage us offline. Um, as far as where we are in the ecosystem, you know, we've been actively involved in stakeholder outreach and beginning to find those unmet needs and we're, that inventory. You know, we were, we're setting up the collaborations with FINH and NIH, and then as we're working with, with other stakeholders like pharma and, and patients, we really hope to come up with some synthesis you know, by the summer of, of where the priority areas are. And so we can begin to launch in, in and the efforts in towards the fall of this year. Um, as I said, the, the task groups and other efforts still exploring new areas outside of ALS um, are, are gonna be active in parallel, um, as well as the efforts that are going on in H Huntington's and the ataxia programs at, at um, Critical Path. Um, we'll be launching a, a PSP task groups and hopefully others in, in parallel so that there's gonna be a, a, a synchronous move of multiple streams of activity. Um, I, our, as I mentioned earlier, you know, our, our philosophy is, is going to be more of a, an open door, you know, um, outreach to the community. We want to have regular touch points, so we will be having follow-up meetings and, and that will invite the patient community to, to attend, you know, for you to hear more about what's going on, but also air your questions or concerns. And the last part I want to mention as well is that we do have an annual meeting plan for September of this year at Critical Path Institute, where you'll be able to hear more about this efforts and progress and, and other rare disease initiatives that are, are undergoing at Critical Path Institute. Uh, next um, slide, please. I want to express my thanks to also to the team here, you know, on this call, those sort of the unsung heroes, you know, additional people uh, like um, Dinesh Green and, and, um, and Hannah, Boone that are that are in the behind the scenes here, but this is sort of the CPRND core team, um, and you know, you know, we've we've added Alex here, and and Laura is is in, instrumental in our successes. These are our contact information. We're all very friendly people, and if and if you have questions and follow, please feel free to outreach to us. Next slide. Um, this has our contact information um, listed there as well. Um, there's our email, there's where you subscribe to more information with CPATH or LinkedIn, and then you know our, our, our other contact information. And last, I do want to echo the, the back the back um, you know information that you know Laura for being our 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 MC and our our connector here. She has been a rock star in, in launching this initiative, and I, I this could not have happened without her. So with that, I will close our our meeting today. Thank you. Thank you everyone again. As Colin mentioned, we'll be following up with a link uh, to the video once that's posted. Again, we welcome all contact from everyone. Don't hesitate to reach out. Um, another thanks to our panelists and speakers and everyone have a great rest of your day. So thank you. Be well, goodbye. Bye all y'all.
Great being with you again. Good to see you, Ron. Good seeing you, Colin. Thank you.